So, hi there, BookTube. Uh, so that impressive looking haul uh, would normally, uh, you'd think, well, there's enough books in there to last me to the end of the year. But I've called this a rehaul, and I'll explain why uh, as we go along, because most of the books there I won't be reading. Um, so just to sort of put you in the picture. So as many of uh, you know, if you follow my channel, I keep my books in the shed because there's no room in the house. And even though they've been sat quite happily in bookshelves, uh, bookcases in that shed for 20 years, this year I've had a severe outbreak of mould. Uh, and I didn't realise sort of over the winter that uh, at least three shelves worth of uh, books were attacked by the mould. And after consulting with various uh, luminaries of how to treat books, uh, including Steve Donoghue, he said, you have to get rid of mildewed books, you can't save them. And if you keep, even the ones that don't look that badly damaged, if you keep them around, the mould will spread to other books. So I don't know exactly how many books I threw away, but it's between 75 and 100. Um, but, you know, some of them are sort of quite important to me. So that raised the question of, OK, well, I cannot afford to replace all 75. So I'm going to have to be a bit discriminatory in, in which ones I go for. So uh, this whole process um, is has led to sort of me to assess, you know, what does it mean to me and maybe to, to others of you uh, when we sort of talk in terms of being a book collector? Um, you know, are you a completist? Are you, is it important to you to have the same uh, editions of uh, books by... Uh, a writer or or does it you know not matter the important thing is is the contents of the book all that sort of things so i had to do a lot of reflection on that in the process of okay well i can afford to buy maybe 20 of those books back um but i can't you know so what you know what's important to me which books and why are they important that they're replaced and others i just have to let go um so the books i lost i lost all my science fiction um, which was one shelf. I lost uh, a shelf that was made up of um, all my uh, Fitzcarraldo editions, novels, which was about 12 at the last count, except one, which was the last one I read called A Tell Them of Battles, Kings and Elephants by Matthias Ennard, uh, which is a relatively new book. I mean, I took receipt of it in October, so I don't know if that has something to do with why it survived. Also, it spent quite a bit of time inside the house because it appeared in various of my uh, booktube videos, including my top 10 books last year. So thank God that one survived. But all the others I had to junk. And on that shelf also were my B.S. Johnson collection, who's a sort of British avant-garde novelist from the 1960s. Uh, a book that I can't believe, you know, because this was also in my top 10 last year and it came out last year, so it was not much older than... The Ennard book, and that was uh, The Early King and The Kid in Yellow by Danny Dyer. That was in my top ten books last year. That I had to throw out. And then there was all my William Burroughs books. Again, bar one, which I'll, I'll come to. You know, I had every single Burroughs book. Uh, and I also had some uh, biographies and, and sort of non-fiction um, about him by people who sort of lived and encountered him, lived with him and encountered him. Uh, and on that shelf also I lost my Roths, although interestingly uh, the two that survived were the two of my favourite, which is uh, The Great American Novel and American Pastoral. So I lost about four Roths, but thankfully not those two, which are by you know, head and shoulders my favourite Philip Roths. I lost Last Exit to Brooklyn, even though none of my other Selbys were damaged next to it. The reason I lost that is because it was a, I bought it second hand. It was from about 1956 or no, 1964, I think. So already it was uh, about 50 odd years old. That's hardly surprising that succumbed to the mould. I lost a book called Callisto. I can't remember the, uh, the author's name, which is a really funny novel. And that, that saddened me that I lost that. Uh, I lost all my uh, Paul Oster books except uh, 4321 because I have that in hardback and it's so big it was on a completely different shelf that it fitted and so on and so on and so on so there's the question for me is okay what do I replace so um you know I went on Amazon you know I went marketplace which straight away means that I'm not going to get the same editions by the same authors but then you see my Burroughs collection they were all different editions or different you know published by different people um so 
you know, I'm not that bothered that they all have to be in this, you know, the same Penguin edition or whatever. But this could have been an opportunity for me with Burroughs, say, whatever Burroughs books I decided to reinvest in. You know, I could have got them all in the Penguin modern classic series where they would all have the same sort of look. But to me, price was the, you know, if, if I saved, you know, three pounds because it was in a different edition, that meant potentially I could get another book. Um, there were certain other factors, such as uh, a William Burroughs book called Our Pook Is Here is £64 on Amazon minimum price, so I knew I couldn't replace that. So I'm going to open these books. Some I'm going to put aside because, they're, you know, I've got more than one by that author. So I'll talk about them, you know, collectively, why I chose those and maybe not others. Um, OK, so the first one is one from my science fiction show. So, as I say, I've probably lost about 25 to 30 science fiction books. And in considering them, there are only really four that I wanted to replace. And this is one of them, China Mielville, Embassy Town. Uh, Mielville's an author, I think I lost three of his books in the coal, by the way. Uh, he's an author that I find immensely frustrating, but he, everything came together in this book. And this is a really good science fiction book about language and linguistics. And that is the thing that links all the choices I've made for my science fiction. So of those 30, I've probably only replaced four or five, and three or four of them are my favourite books in science fiction, and they all have a linguistic element. So that's China Mielville, Embassy Town. Um, ah, okay. Paul Oster, A New York Trilogy. So as I say, I lost three Oster books, including this. Uh, but this is my favourite. It was his debut novel. And, but I think it's, in my opinion, his best by a long way. Uh, and it's the only one I wanted to replace. Now, this is published by Faber and Faber. I had the original. Uh, they were all three in the same series, so I've lost that. But anyway, the book is more important than the edition. Of course, when you buy second-hand books, you run the risk that they, you know, they're vulnerable to mildew anyway. Um, so it could be out of the frying pan into the fire because one of these books has just smelt very old and dusty um, oh yeah someone else I lost was uh, Kafka's Metamorphosis like the um, last exit to Brooklyn I bought it second hand so again it was already sort of 50, 60 years old oh William S Burroughs The Last Words of Duck Shorts now this is probably one of the few books out of the 20 or so that I bought that I will actually be rereading because it was so avant-garde, so radical, and I really want to read it again. It's sort of done in the in the form of a film script, but it's it's a film script that leaps about in different sort of genres. Uh, Dutch Shorts was an American gangster, I think a bootlegger, who was shot when he went to the toilet in a tavern. He was shot by his his uh, rival enemies. Uh, and but it took him two days to die and, and detectives sat around his hospital bed to see if he'd basically uh, in his sort of um, you know stupor uh, reveal any secrets about other gangsters so I am going to reread that one of the few Franz Kafka, The Castle. Now, I didn't lose this in the coal by mould. I never owned it. So, having said that, I'm not a completist. Um, I am, we're, we're hit my real, real top authors, of which Kafka is one. I read this in college, from the, I borrowed it from the college library, so I've never owned it. And it is actually my favourite Kafka uh, novel of, of the three of them. Um, so I thought it was about time I owned it. Uh, I probably won't be rereading it, though. Unless I have the privilege in my old age when I've retired from work, where I just have all this unbounded time and I still have my wits. Last Exit to Brooklyn um, by Hubert Selby. Uh, that's not the edition that they photographed in Amazon. Not that it matters, as I say. Um, so I did lose that. Uh, I'm not, I lost about half of my Selby. Two of my favourite ones, The Room and... Uh, Song of the Silent Snow survived. I lost the demon. I lost this. I'm not going to replace the demon because I didn't think it was that great a book. But this I had to have. 
I also lost that one. Oh, Nicholson Baker was another. Was another author I lost on the American shelf. Kafka, The Metamorphosis. This is a very edi different edition from the one that I lost, but it's rather beautiful. And I assume this is purely The Metamorphosis. It doesn't have any other short stories, which is good, because I have a complete book of short stories. Although, for some reason, it doesn't include The Metamorphosis. I think because this probably rates as a novella. It's 59 pages. So I am a Kafka completist now, because his other books survived. OK, so this isn't actually a replacement. This is Sam Lipsight's Hark, which just came out either this year or late last year. Yeah, 2019, so it came out this year. And I lost two Sam Lipsight books on my American shelf. I lost Homeland and The Subject Steve. And I'm not going to replace them because they didn't blow me away. He's very hip and flip and funny, but he, there's no sort of lasting sort of memories of his books but this one sounded like it had a bit more of uh, a bit more sort of meat to it um it's a story of our times of lost souls seeking meaning and dignity in a chaotic ridiculous and often dangerous world so um i will be reading that but there again it's not a reread and as i say i'm not going to replace the two lip sight levels that i lost so hopefully that will that will represent my lip sight reading. And thank God I've got this again, as I said. I was re of all the books I lost, this was the one that I think hurt me the most because as I say, the Ennard survived, and this, which was the same age same age as the Ennard, had to go. So I'm really pleased that I've got that back. So that, that begs the question of you know, I'm not gonna reread I'm very unlikely to reread these books, but somewhere in me it feels really important to have them. Now, sometimes you want books on the shelf because you, you, you may not reread them cover to cover, but you know you're going to refer back to them. You know, there's a quote in it or something. Um, but some psychology, you just think, I love that book so much, I want to own it. OK, that's William S. Burroughs. I'm going to come back to Burroughs because there are other Burroughs books in here. Ah, OK, on to my second science fiction this is Solaris by Stanislaw Lem, which is one of the best science fiction books ever written. It's been made into a film with at least two, if not three, versions. Andrei Tarkovsky made one. There's one with George Clooney, and I think there's a third. Now, this is the only science fiction book of mine that, that isn't particularly about linguistics, but it is a supreme, supreme book. I lost two or three other Lems, and he is a good writer, but this is so head and shoulders above above all these others that I've read so far. I don't see a need to reinvest in them and, and maintain them in my library, but this I absolutely have to have. Oh, there's two in here. William Faulkner, The Sound of the Fury. Uh, I lost it, unfortunately, and uh, I'm not a Faulkner complete here, so I've, I haven't even read them all. Uh, but the ones I've read I do love, so that's this, uh, Sanctuary, uh, As I Lay Dying, which I've also reordered. So I'm not a completist, I have to have all the Faulkner's books, but the ones I've read I love, I do want them. And this is Jeff New, Needle in the Groove. So this is a science fiction fantasy book, although... It's one of the ones with the, maybe the least science fiction elements of Noon's writing. I lost all my Jeff Noon collection, which is about five or six, except, fortunately, the 25th anniversary edition of Vert Hardback, which I won a signed copy from Jeff. So hopefully that will survive, even though it's next to all the ones that didn't. Uh, of the others, so I had Pollen, uh, what else did I have? I uh, can't remember, but this is the one. This is set in the, in the world of music and particularly appealed to me. That's why I wanted this one again. Tim O'Brien, The Things They Carried. Again, I was gutted that my copy of this succumbed. This is a brilliant, brilliant book, and I just have to have this in my collection. It is seminal writing. This is a small one. Don't know. Oh, I think it's probably will be a Penguin Melbourne Classics. I actually think it might be a Burroughs. Oh no, it isn't. I know what this is. Another one from my science fiction 
collection. This is Sun, 40 Tales of the Afterlife by David Eagleman, which I've talked about quite a few times. Um, he's a, um, a, brain psych, a brain scientist. He studies the human brain. And this is a book that is 40 very short tales, about four pages long, where it messes with the sense of our senses and perception and scale and everything. So again, not really about linguistics, except in the sense of how our notions of scale, of frame, and directionality and dimensionality are framed in language. But it's not, it's not front and central linguistics. It's more about our sensory perceptive perception apparatus. Brilliant little book. Have to have that in my library. Now this is a big book. Ah, oh, that's why. So Ted Morgan, uh, Literary Outlaw by William S. Burroughs. So this is a, um, a biography of him that I've read before. Everything about Burroughs' life, including when he shot his wife. It's a really good biography. I had it originally in, in hardback. This is not nearly as nice an edition, although the photo is better. Uh, I wish I still had it in hardback, but this is the cheapest. Now, these were the only ones not on Marketplace because they were placed competitive to Amazon proper. As I lay dying, so another Faulkner. So a very di different edition from, let's see if I can. So one is uh, vintage classic red and the other is published by oh, vintage classics, but a different livery. Go figure. Um, okay. Now one of the things about dead authors is you don't expect them to have new books and you don't really, you know, once someone's been dead for 10 years, you don't really sort of keep going back and looking at Amazon to see if there's anything new. But because I had to go back and look at all the Burroughs work, see which ones I was going to get and which ones I didn't, I discovered this which came out last year. This is William S. Burroughs, the revised Boy Scout Manual, an electronic revolution. And it sort of really totally predicts, you know, the social media age and, and what that does to communication and stuff. So I'm really looking forward to reading this. So this is a new read. And, OK, so that leaves these two Burroughs books, The Western Lands and The Place of Dead Roads, which are two books in the Burroughs trilogy, the third being The Cities of the Red Knight, which is the only one of my Burroughs books to survive. And the reason I think that survived is because, again, even though I'd read it, I'd read it at a library, and it was the only Burroughs book I didn't own. And like the Kafka, the castle, I thought, this is crazy, for the sake of sort of completion, I suppose. I, I got hold of a second-hand copy of it last year uh, in this Penguin series. Um, and because it was really, it wasn't new, I didn't buy it new, I bought it second hand, but because it hadn't been in the bookshelf very long, I think it managed to survive. So these are the other two books in that trilogy, which were written towards the end of his writing career. And I personally, at my favourite Burroughs works, I find his early works quite inaccessible. But what that means is I've had to let go. I had a, um, a collected uh, three novels in one, which is uh, Nova Express, Soft Machine and The Wild Boys. That's gone. I also had the ticket that exploded. I also had Junkie and Queer, and I had, uh, did I say Naked Lunch? Naked Lunch, if I didn't say that. I've let them all go, because his earlier works I didn't particularly get on with. I mean, Junkie and Queer are quite uh, a lot more sort of straight than his sort of more difficult writing, his sort of cut-up, which I didn't really get on with. But this trilogy, I think, is all I need to maintain my Burroughs collection, plus this, which could turn out to be rather wonderful, or it could be just, a, you know, the clippings from the floor that someone's found and put into a book, you know, we'll have to wait and see on that. Um, and that, you know, that, that will be my Burroughs collection, no longer complete. You know, Arpook is here at £64. I can't justify, it's not even that great a book, Arpook is here. Um, so I've had to let Burroughs go, my Burroughs books go. And finally, this beast, which I had to pick up from the post office today because they said that's too big to go in my letterbox. And for once, I have to agree with them. And this is all from one publisher. So I said I had originally uh, about 12 Fitzcarraldo books. One has survived. So of the other 11... You know, which of those 11 did I want to preserve? Although, Matthias Enard, absolutely, I had to. That was in my 
top three books of 2017. So I definitely wanted that again. It's a bit weird now because, of course, it's, you know, this, these have come from the publisher. Um, so it's mint. You know, it doesn't look as though it's been read, but I have read it. Uh, and I think the deal I got from Fitzcarraldo was four books for £35, which is just under £9 each. Fitzgerald editions to buy new. I mean, I know these are new, but if you buy them in a bookshop, one at a time, they're quite expensive. They're between about <coughs> ten and twelve pounds each. So this was quite a good deal. Um, the next one is the Doll's Alphabet, which is a really good book of short stories by Camilla Grudova, who, despite her name, I think is Canadian. So I wanted that back again. And there are Private for Cadavers by Ed Atkins, who's an artist. He's a visual artist. This is his first book, and there's a uh, astounding debilitating piece of work to read it's you know just language is so out there so extreme it, you know a lot about the body because he's an artist he does a lot of visual art about about the human body and this is putting that into words in these extraordinary narratives and then i took the opportunity because i decided of the other eight or nine none of them were that great that i thought oh, i really have to own these so I took the advantage of four for £35 to invest in one that I hadn't read before. Even though this is one of the first that they ever published called John Keane, Counter Narratives, which I think is a brilliant title. And I think this is sort of alternative, uh, fictitious versions of actual historical events. So there you have it. That is my rehaul. I haven't quite got all the books in. That is most of them have come in. Um, off the top of my head, I can't remember what else is, is still to come, but there are, there's, there's a few. Um, so, uh, you know, I had to assess, you know, which books did I like? Why did I want to reown them, even though I'm never going to read them? You know, what does that say about, you know, covers, editions, being a completist, not being a completist? So I want to be a Kafka completist. But I wasn't bothered about being a Burroughs completist. Well, that's because I love all of Kafka's books, whereas Burroughs wrote some books that, you know, ho-hum. So, you know, it's, it filled me with sadness when I had to throw away 70-odd books or 100 books, whatever it was in the end. I hope it hasn't spread to any more. Uh, I'm going to move as many of my books inside the house and out of that environment to preserve them as I can. Um, but I can't physically get them all in the house. That's why they were out of the shed in the first place. So hopefully I won't have to replace any more. Uh, if, even if I do, I won't bother making another video about it. But I just wanted to share that with you because it wasn't just a haul video. It wasn't just about buying books again that, you know, you've lost for one reason or another. Um, I think that, you know, it, it made me think and it might make you reflect on, you know, well, what, you know, what does having a book collection actually mean for me as a reader? OK, so thanks very much. Till next time.